Hello. So in this video, we're going to have a look at buffer stock schemes. And in particular, we're going to evaluate uh, buffer stock schemes, looking at how effective they are uh, and any limitations associated with them. So just to recap, a buffer stock scheme is used to correct the market failure, uh, in particular, the market failure of price instability, otherwise known as volatile prices. There are only a limited number of evaluative points to talk about with regards to a buffer stock scheme. So it's really important that when we talk about the evaluative points, we explain them in detail. So first of all, the point we can talk about is high storage costs. So why is that a relevant point? Well, let's remember, if there is a particularly high supply, so for example, let's go back to our example of wheat. So if wheat was produced and there was a really good harvest of wheat, the price would fall below the minimum price. So what the government do, the government buys up that stock in order uh, to raise the price to make sure it's within the specified limits. So obviously the government's bought all these stocks up and what they're going to therefore have to do is they're going to have to store those stock, uh, that stock, aren't they? Uh, store that stock in particularly for when there is a low supply and therefore they can release the stock onto the market uh, to help uh, lower the price if the price is too high, uh, if there was a, a poor harvest, for example. So that's why there are high storage costs associated with buffer stock schemes. So we just need to make sure we elaborate and expand upon this point of high storage costs. So the high storage cost is going to come at an opportunity cost uh, for the government. Uh, and therefore, what we may see is we may see... Uh, reduce spending on other areas of the public sector. Uh, so reduce spending on education or healthcare, for example. And we may just want to elaborate that that reduced spending on education and healthcare may lead to a fall in standards of living. I know that kind of goes into a little bit of macroeconomics there, uh, but the key foundation of an opportunity cost is microeconomics based. Uh, I know the final point about standards of living uh, overlaps into macroeconomics, but it's fine to have a little brief explanation. But the most important thing here is we've elaborated on the point of high storage costs, meaning there is an opportunity cost for the government. Therefore, they may spend less on education and healthcare and there's reduced standards of living. It's really important at the start that we explain why there's high storage cost. And as I explained, there are high storage costs because the government buys up the stock. They keep hold of it until it is needed to be released onto the market. So there are high storage costs uh, there. Second point, again, is related to uh, costs. Uh, again, it's the cost to buy up stock so obviously the government wants to ensure uh, prices are stable and reduce price volatility and ensure there's price stability so they're going to have to buy up the stock buying up stock is going to come at a cost to the government they've got to buy up the stock that increase in demand from d to d1 to push the price up from p2 to p3 only happens because the government buy up the stock what the government's going to need to do to buy up the stock well they need money to buy up the stock to buy up the stock aren't they so again we can mention the point about opportunity cost occurring there okay uh, you could have linked these point two evaluative points together under the umbrella of uh, costs and you could explain why that there, there are high costs uh, and then you may have wanted to follow the same chain of uh, development there with regards to reduce spending on other areas and therefore that lowers standard of uh, living but two key points we've talked about so far high storage costs and cost to buy up the stock so let's have a look at a third point now uh, products such as wheat for example which a buffer stock scheme is used for it could also be used for a product such as rice these products are uh, can be perishable so wheat for example is perishable what does that mean? Well, that means that uh, it has a sell-by date and beyond a certain date, the uh, 
we will go off and will be unable to be released onto the market. So therefore, we can't store uh, wheat for a particularly long period of time. We need to therefore make sure we explain why that means that the buffer stock scheme may not be effective. And I'll, let me just explain that now. So obviously, if wheat uh, goes off and is there un therefore unable to be released onto the market, well, basically, we've wasted our time buying up the stock because when it comes to a time of uh, a period of a poor harvest of wheat, for example, we therefore won't have the necessary stock to release onto the market because all the wheat that we originally bought has now gone out of date and therefore can't be released onto the market. If it can't be released onto the market, we can't increase supply and the price can't, therefore can't be reduced and price stability can't be achieved. So that's really important that we explain that. So perishable products uh, go off can't release stock so therefore if low supply there would be no increase in supply and as a result there would be no decrease in price and therefore there would be no price stability So as you can see, it's really important that we explain that point in detail and why uh, a product being perishable means a buffer stock scheme therefore may not be very effective. Fourth point. A, basically, this guaranteed minimum price. So what producers know is that what, whatever the case, they will get a minimum price of PMIN, whatever that minimum price may be. But the lowest price that the producer will get is P min. So what that uh, incentivizes firms to do is it incentivizes them to uh, overproduce the product because they know no matter how much they produce, they will get that minimum price. So the more they produce, they could potentially increase their total revenue by ensuring that more, if they produce more, they will always get that price. And hopefully that should therefore improve their total revenue. So over production so minimum price ensures producers receive overproduction minimum price ensures producers will always Minimum price ensures producers will receive, sorry. So minimum price ensures producers receive P, P min in the worst case scenario. So in the worst case scenario, the producer will get uh, the price P min. It could be higher, but it's not going to be higher than P max. Uh, but they always know they'll get P min. So there's incentive, therefore, to keep producing more because they know they'll get that. What, what does that overproduction mean? So that, as it said, is going to lead to overproduction. What is that going to mean, therefore? Well, again, that's going to uh, lead to a increased cost for the government. Because obviously they're going to have to buy up more stock now in order to raise that price. So the increased cost for the government. Uh, and again, that could lead to an opportunity cost. So as you can see, we've talked quite a lot about cost here. Uh, but there is another point that we may wish to consider about buying up stock. Uh, and I'm going to elaborate upon that point now. But just to recap, to date, we've looked at high storage costs and we've looked at cost of buying up stock and how that leads to opportunity cost. We've talked about potentially the use of buffer stock schemes on perishable products, such as wheat, for example, therefore meaning that price stability cannot be achieved because we can't release the stock onto the market to lower the price. We've talked about the minimum price encouraging producers to 
continually produce more because they will be guaranteed that minimum price and therefore that's going to lead to overproduction and again increasing costs for the government and leading to an opportunity uh, cost. Evaluative point number five that we're going to talk about is we're going to talk about uh, the aspect that buffer stock schemes tend to be used on very large markets. On large commodity markets. So what do we mean by that? Well, let's take the uh, market for wheat, for example. When we consider the market for wheat, we're thinking about a very vast market. It's an extremely large market. If you think about how much wheat is produced around the world, for example, uh, the amount of tons of wheat that are produced, I can imagine, are in the millions, probably. Don't quote me on that, but you can quite conceivably see that there is a significant amount of wheat produced in the world. If you were to influence the wheat market, therefore, you would need to buy up an extremely large amount of stock. And that's obviously going to come at a significant cost. So let me just to recap that. Obviously, if the price of wheat fell below the minimum price, in order to affect that price, what you're going to have to do is you're going to have to buy up an extremely large amount of it. You can't just buy up one or two tons of wheat and therefore ensure that the minimum pr price is achieved. You're going to have to buy up several thousands of tons probably in order to ensure you get price, uh, st uh, price stability. So it's very hard to influence these commodity markets. Large quantity... So large commodity markets, i.e. there's a large quantity uh, of the product being produced. Difficult to influence, i.e. large amount of stock needs to be bought if price is below p min okay so if the price was at p2 and you were trying to get the price within the upper and lower limit so between the maximum and minimum price what you'd need to do is you need to buy a significantly large amount of the stocks i.e wheat in order to get the price uh up 2p min and above it but obviously not above p max so large amount of stock needs to be bought if the price is below p min uh, to ensure price stability and that therefore may not be possible because if the market is so big and so much has been produced it may just not be fe feasible to in order to purchase enough of the stock to raise the price uh, and that's obviously a significant issue if price stability is achieved by buying up stock there's obviously a large cost involved and obviously that large cost uh, involved comes at an opportunity cost. Okay, so let me just recap that point that we've talked about here. So there's a large commodity markets. Buffer stock schemes are used uh, on commodities and these commodity markets are vast. What we mean by that is obviously there's a large quantity being produced of these commodities. And therefore, as a result, it's difficult to influence them. What we mean by it's difficult to influence, it's difficult to influence the price. So let's take the example. If there was a large, a large amount of stock would need to be bought up if the price fell below P min to ensure price stability. And therefore, if you've got to buy up thousands, if millions of tons of a particular commodity, then it may therefore not be possible to ensure price stability because it's just not feasible. If you were able to achieve uh, price stability by buying up a significant amount of stock that would come at a large cost and again that would come at a opportunity cost and then finally 
our final point to consider with regards to buffer stock schemes is uh, Pmax and Pmin. Okay, so what do we mean by Pmax and Pmin? Well, what we've when we're, this evaluative point refers to, uh, what are they? So, for example, if For example, if P min is particularly high, so if a, high, a minimum price is particularly high, obviously if there is a uh, large supply, again, that large supply is going to mean it's, mean it's harder to influence uh, the market and ensure price stability. So why will that be? Why will it be harder to influence the market and ensure price stability if the P-min is particularly high? Well, if the, price, if the minimum price is particularly high and therefore the price uh, in the free market uh, was is going to be considerably further away from the minimum price. And therefore, what you're going to have to do is you're going to have to buy up more stock in order to uh, achieve that minimum price because the difference between the minimum price and the free market price is so different. Therefore, you're going to have to buy up more stock and it's going to ha be harder to achieve price stability because you're going to have to buy up so much more stock in order to achieve that. Uh, large supply, harder to influence market and ensure price stability. Uh, uh, large supply, P min particularly high. Large supply, harder to influence. Because, uh, as I just mentioned, the free market price would be far lower than P min. And therefore, more stock would need to be bought. And therefore, if more stock needs to be bought, it's going to be harder to influence the market. Maybe again, because it may not be feasible either. Okay. So just to recap the uh, evaluative points that we've discussed here with buffer stock schemes. As I said, they're not particularly vast in the number of points, but it's really important that we explain them. So obviously, uh, high storage costs, because obviously when you buy up stock, when the uh, harvest is particularly good, you need to store that in case there is a poor harvest in the future. And therefore, you can release the uh, stock onto the market to lower the price. Those high costs uh, of storage and also cost of buying up the stock stock come up an opportunity cost. And we can link in some development with regards to decreased spending in alternative areas. And that may have for lower standards of living. We talked about particularly use of buffer stock with perishable products. Uh, and therefore, if the product does perish, uh, therefore, the stock is not going to be available to, re to be released onto the market when there is a poor harvest or a low supply and therefore there isn't going to be an increase in supply because there is no stock to release onto the market and therefore the price won't fall and price stability can't be achieved also we talked about uh, overproduction uh, that minimum price kind of incentivizes uh, firms and producers to keep on producing because they will get this minimum price and that overproduction uh, therefore may mean that it's going to cost more to governments in order to influence the price and again that's going to come at an opportunity cost these markets that buffer stock schemes are applied to these are large markets and therefore these large markets are difficult to influence if you want to raise the price of a product in this partic in a particular commodity market you're going to have to buy thousands if not hundreds of thousands if not millions of tons of something in order to uh, influence the uh, market obviously the larger the market the more you're going to have to buy in order if you wanted to uh, push up the price and therefore that may not be possible uh, and therefore price stability can't be achieved or if it 
if you do or if a government does buy up large amounts of stock it is going to come in at extremely large cost and therefore there again there is an opportunity cost involved there and then finally we talked about where is the minimum and maximum price set at if the p min the minimum price is particularly high and there is a large supply it's going to be particular it's going to be harder to influence the market and ensure price stability because that what would happen is if there is a large supply the free market price would be far lower than the minimum price because we are we said that the example in this example that the p min would be particularly high and therefore more stock would be needed to be bought up in order to raise the price and again obviously we've got the issue of opportunity costs with governments it costing the government more money if the p min was particularly high and they needed to buy up more stock